Boom. That's right. <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for Dr. Stefan Esser. And today he's going to be telling us the truth about supplements. Please welcome him to the show. Chef AJ, great to be with you as always. Let's uh, get right in and have fun together. This is a hot topic and a crucial topic for all of us who care about our health to understand a little bit more. We're going to start with the basics of supplementation. We're going to go to some high level stuff, and then I'm going to give you some recommendations at the end. So we're going to talk about the what, the why, the when, the where, and the should you or not. So Let's start right in. Introduction. Supplement is the addition of an extra element or amount to something. And when we talk about supplements, there are a lot of different categories. You got vitamins, minerals, herbs, oil supplements, hormone activators, multivitamins, multiminerals, the list goes on. And so it's important when we look at each of these categories to identify, do we need them? Should we be taking them? What are their side effects? What are their risks? And uh, how might they help us? As it turns out, almost 80% of Americans use supplements on a regular basis. And so you can see this sort of breakdown over the last number of years. This is some of the more recent data from the vitamin and mineral industries. Uh, so just kind of a progressively climbing use over time. And what is most commonly used are going to be multivitamins, right? So 98% of supplement users take vitamins and minerals, and 73% of them take a multivitamin. This perception that using a multivitamin will be beneficial to my health because it's going to fill in the little sort of empty spaces or cracks. Now, with the standard American diet, of course, one must question, is it really make a difference? If you're just eating Mickey D's and Chick-fil-A, does it matter if you take a multivitamin, yay or nay? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. What other things are people using though? Well, herbals and botanicals, right? 40% of users replied that they're using some form of herbal or botanical. Things like cranberry extract for urinary tract infections, turmeric for inflammation and pain, echinacea for you know, immune system function, milk thistle for liver detoxification. There's a smattering of these different herbals and botanicals being used. And then of course, sort of special little supplements here, things like melatonin for sleep, omega-3 fatty acids, as we'll talk about for ADHD, for immune function, for heart health, for dementia, and the like. Also, sports nutrition, very popular, right? 30% of users using some form of supplement for their sporty activities, whether it be hydration drinks, recovery powders, <laughs> or protein powder drinks, bars, and the rest. And then, of course, weight management, extremely popular to use a host of different herbals and supplements like chromium picolinate, right, Garcinia cambogia, et cetera, uh, to facilitate uh, weight management and weight loss. Over time, we see, right, the amount of the use of supplements kind of changing and varying, right, the types of supplements used, right, so we get these 20 and overs, uh, right, compared to our older population, we begin to see some variation on the type of supplements used. You can see that in better form here, where you notice that ages 20 to 40, right, multivitamins, and then a few other smattering of things. Then we see 60 and over, look at the difference. All of a sudden, vitamin D, significantly increasing. Omega-3 fat use, significantly increasing. Uh, calcium, significantly increasing in its use. So depending upon the age category, it appears that different groups use different supplements. And uh, part of that may be need, and part of that is likely marketing, as we'll talk about, uh, as far as what people really need. When you look at why people use supplements, their answers vary across the board, everything from healthy aging to overall health and wellness to immune health and the rest. And I bring this up because today I'm going to challenge you to think about why are you doing what you're doing? We're going to have that conversation later in the conversation, in the, in, the, in the presentation is why are you taking a supplement if you are, and what are you hoping to facilitate with the use of it? It's interesting to look at the use of supplements in America versus the European Union. Uh, I'm quite compelling to look at, right? Um, you know, you would think that if supplements were the God's gift to the universe, well, then America would be the healthiest nation on earth based on the amount of supplements used and the supplement market, how much we spend on it. 
Uh, but the projected amounts of continued climb in the supplement industry is quite impressive. This red being 2026, the projected climb. So, wow, right? If you want to make some money, maybe it's time you invest in a supplement market. Oh, could that influence some doctor's recommendation? Money? Never, right? But it was worth us talking about. So we're going to start off with supplements and the negative potential effects. We're going to start with adverse events, which means something that occurs as a result of taking a supplement or a pill. I'm going to present a couple studies. This one is uh, done over a nine-year period following individuals who came to emergency rooms across the nation and looking at the various side effects that they experienced as a result of taking medications or, pardon me, taking supplements. Um, and so it's interesting when you look at these, right? Some of them uh, you can kind of see are a little, I think, bogus. Like for example, this one, an unsupervised ingestion by a child. There were 946 cases out of a total of 3,600 seen, but this is considered as an adverse event of a supplement. Well, that's not really fair. That's not really a, you know, a side effect of using it appropriately. So we always want to, when we look at data like this, kind of break it down, right? Because if you twist this data a certain way, you're going to say, oh, wow, look how dangerous all these supplements are. But the reality is unsupervised ingestion by a child, right, who takes a whole ton of iron, let's say, and then needs their stomach pump, that's not really a side effect of a supplement. That is a poor parenting, right, or some random chance event. Nevertheless, we do see that there are a lot of different reactions that can occur to individuals, right? You kind of see it through here. Uh, whether they be difficulty swallowing just due to the capsules with some level of choking or airway obstruction, whether it be nausea and vomiting or abdominal pain, whether it be severe allergic reactions or an upregulation of anxiety, uh, as well as heart palpitations. You can see that with chest pain and tachycardia as one of the leading sort of adverse events. I remember well, I was working in a hospital and we had a gentleman admitted to the floor who was in raging liver failure. And, you know, he had no another, he didn't drink excessively. He wasn't uh, taking any other medications that would damage his liver. Everybody was kind of confused why this guy suddenly his belly was swollen. His legs were, you know, full of fluid and he, all of his liver panel was absolutely off the charts. And we finally asked him, Hey, what else are you taking? It turned out he was taking a supplement to increase the size of his penis. And he and his buddies were all having a challenge to take this supplement, see what would happen. And it was absolutely terrifying because as you research this supplement, many of the components of it, they actually increase the risk of liver failure. In this case, he had an acute liver failure as a result of it. Once that was stopped and he was given some appropriate support for his liver, all his liver recovered, fortunately, but in many cases it doesn't. So it's interesting. That was my first experience with seeing the incredibly negative and potentially dangerous side effects of supplementation. This slide shows us in graphic format kind of the product category and the adverse events. What you'll notice here is that weight loss supplements, especially in the ages of 20s to 40s, have some of the highest rates of adverse events. Many of these weight loss supplements are concocted in such a way to increase metabolism by increasing heart rate, which can lead to an elevation in heart rate, a more rapid heart rate, as well as abnormal heart rhythms, right? And palpitations and some chest pain, severe anxiety and the rest. So I commonly say, especially just across the board, my recommendation to you with regards to supplementation starting here would be to say, never do supplements for weight loss. It is not the appropriate manner to lose weight and the potential negative side effects and adverse events are real. So you should not be doing that you should be following, if your goals are weight loss, the recommendations of Chef AJ and I in regards to a micronutrient-dense, calorie-poor diet that results in meaningful long-term weight loss. Another study following 41,000 unique adverse events across the U.S. over a almost three-year period showed once again that there are quite a few different potential side effects. And again, look at the bottom here. Mark products marketed for weight loss and glycemic or blood sugar control were the ones most likely to induce adverse events and result in an individual having to see a physician for evaluation and management. So again, kind of using supplements for weight loss, absolutely not the right choice. Using supplements for blood sugar control, also not the right decision. Um, and want to be very conscientious and careful 
because each of these can result in side effects, whether it be hypoglycemia, lowering your blood sugars too low, results in you passing out or having problems, uh, or as I mentioned, the palpitations, the chest pain, uh, and other abnormal symptoms. So what do we know? Almost 80% of people use supplements, a lot of different reasons they do so, and people are spending billions of dollars per year on supplements. It is a massive industry. Adverse events are real, but the majority of them appear to occur in the areas of weight loss supplements and also, as mentioned, glycemic control. When we think about an industry, I always think it's fascinating to know how we got here, right? How do we end up with this whole uh, massive market in supplements? Well, this started millennia ago, didn't it? We have a whole history of herbal medicine in 3000 BC, right? The Chinese Pen Sao with over 300 herbs described in detail and their effects on human health. 1500 BC, the Indian Vedic writings, right? With a formulary of more than 500 medicinal plants. The Egyptians tested herbals on slaves before royalty, right? Opiates from poppy flowers, right? Uh, hyoscyamine, scopalamine, things for, uh, for our autonomic function, you know, from mandrake plank, all these cool sort of things. The Romans had this. Now, once we get into the 1700s, there becomes a rift. The herbalists and the physicians, right, begin this big rift. And we in America uh, essentially inherited this rift. Instead of having kind of a comprehensive approach to health using herbals, supplements, medicines all together, we began to have two big groups, right? And so then we get into the Flexner Report in 1911 that led to the creation of the allopathic medical industry as compared to and in conflict with the osteopathic, homeopathic, and naturopathic organizations. And so we began to have this big rift where now you had groups that used medicines and, and, and surgeries, and you had those who used supplements. And we continue to see some residual of that in our society today. You know, by 1870 in America, we had 650 herbal monographs. They're quite fascinating to look at. These description of different herbs, things like foxglove, right? They can be used for abnormal heart rhythms and, uh, you know, things like uh, various tinctures and herbal, whether it be the roots or the aerial parts or the flowers and all of these therapeutic effects that they would have. Well, over time, we began to lose sight and touch and use of these supplements more and more because of a host of reasons that we're going to talk about. But it's estimated, in fact, that almost 40% of U.S. drugs contain some derived, you know, plant-based derived source. There's something in them, right? Whether it be, you can see some examples below, right? Colchicine, autumn crocus, digoxin, foxglove, scopalamine, jimson weed, taxol, Pacific U, and Christine periwinkle. Very interesting, right? So a lot of these drugs, uh, vincristine and taxol, right, are chemotherapeutic agents. Digoxin is for abnormal heart rhythms right? All of these different drugs were derived originally from plants. You know, it's kind of cool to kind of see this initial origin of where they came from. And so there is a lot of sort of interwoven history there that many people have lost sight of. Now, the whole herbal, you know, sort of supplement world was completely uncontrolled until about the 1990s. 1994, in fact, the DHEA was passed by Congress. You see, back before 1994, right, you could essentially write anything on a bottle and sell it as such. And while that gave great freedom to individuals, the problem was that the human heart can always be a corrupted place. And unfortunately, there are individuals out there who don't really care about people and care more about money. And as a result, might sell something that has something in it that shouldn't be in there. They could put individuals at risk. And so in the DSHEA, this was a law passed by Congress that said that a product intended to supplement the diet, right? You had to define what a supplement was and that it had one of the ingredients, you can read through that whole list, and that it had to be labeled. It's interesting, I'm old enough in this field, but I still remember, right? There were some health food stores near my grandfather's ranch and some of the people used to come and fast at the ranch. We were friends with them. And I remember them railing against the federal government you know, in the 1990s, saying, or in 1980s, even, you know, oh, they're trying to get their hands in on everything and all the rest. And so I understand that part of the argument that federal overreach, etc. But I also understand the importance to protect people from things, right, and make sure that they're not being taken advantage of, because we all know 
the history of the snake oil salesman, right? Kind of selling a, some alcohol in a bottle with a little color and saying it's going to grow your hair back and then quickly moving on to the next town. And unfortunately, that sort of behavior went on and continues in many ways to go on today. So we all need to be, and that's part of my goal of this talk, is that you understand more by the end of it and can make more informed decisions about your personal health and the use of supplements. So this DSHEA Act, right, which kind of passed, said a lot of things. It said you had to have the words dietary supplement, right, on the bottle. You had to say the quantity of the contents. You had to have a supplements facts area, like a panel, right? If you had a plant in there, you had to say what part of the plant was being used for that. Uh, if you had a proprietary blend, it still had to report the listing of what was in there, so on and so forth. And I think in large part, these are good things. Because if I pick up a bottle, I want to know, kind of at least have some assurance of what they think at least is in there, right? Because the challenge with the manufacture, production, and harvest of these different things, let's say a nice herbal that I want to take, well, that herbal has to be harvested somewhere. Well, are there other weeds growing in the field? Did other contaminants get in there? Did the neighbor who sprays his corn with some toxin also spray it and it blew across onto this plant that I'm now going to use as a supplement? Um, when the supplement, when this plant was harvested, was it dried, dehydrated, and processed in a machine that used, has aluminum? Did I get some aluminum residue or nickel or things like that into it? This is the challenge that we face uh, with the use of products that come not from our own homes. And so we have no control over exactly the path that got it to us. So the problem with, and I'd say the limits with even the law of the DSHA is there's no clear safety or standardization, right? It's not that, okay, if you're gonna give me a vitamin E, that it has to be a full spectrum vitamin E, right? Versus no, it can just be alpha tocopherol, right? Because vitamin E comes in about five different isoforms, alpha, beta, delta, gamma, et cetera. And each of these isoforms has different physiologic effects on the body. So if you're taking vitamin E and it's just alpha tocopherol, that potentially, as we'll talk about, can be very inflammatory to the body. So should there be more law that says, well, if you're going to sell vitamin E, that it has to be the full spectrum? I'm not sure. But most importantly, you and I need to be educated about that. And that's why Chef AJ and I are here with you today. But the other problems is there's no required adverse reporting, right? So let's say an organization is making a supplement like the guy with the penis enlargement product, and he goes into liver failure. Well, that organization, if they find out about that, don't have to report back to anybody that it happened. They can either just pull it off the market or they can keep marketing it and wait till they're 200 cases or wait until they get a lawsuit, right? But again, if they have it all positioned with an LLC and this, that, and the other, maybe they'll be able to protect themselves and won't even really bear the burden, Right. So, oh gosh, this is this is challenging, right? Because I don't like over excessive government overreach, but at the same time, I want to keep people safe. So, right, things for us to think about. What do we want at the end of the day? We want to enhance our health. We want to reduce our disease risk. We want to avoid adverse events. We want to spend our money wisely. In order to help you with that, you know, there's a problem because people in need, that might be you and I, are vulnerable. People can be poorly educated, making them vulnerable, right? Remember, much of the American populace has less than like a fifth grade education or eighth grade education. And then there's this huge lucrative industry, right? $46 billion spent in supplements in 2020. So we've got this bad intersection, people needing something, lack of education, some people wanting to help, others just wanting to make profit. And all this is you know, in here. So... E, wow, right? Even let's say I start a supplement company. I make sure I source everything wonderfully. I develop a great name for the supplement company. And then I sell the company after 10 years. Well, now everybody expects a certain level, right? It's assumed that it's there. Well, is it still there when it got bought by some investment group, right? Or some global conglomerate? Or are they going to actually just be like, the heck with this, let's just make money and go. And that's the problem because what we think isn't always real. So if you look, these 14 mega corporations own the supplements you may have heard of. Check this out. Garden of Life owned by Nestle. Douglas Laboratories and Pure Encapsulations owned by Nestle. Renew Life owned by Clorox, right? Swanson owned by SPC. You know, the list goes on. 
I mean, this is crazy when you look at this SolarAe owned by HGGC, right? These are massive global conglomerates who have bought out these companies that were doing well and established a good reputation. Metagenics owned by Alticor. I mean, it's fascinating to see. <laughs> and this blew my mind right here, right? Look, Pfizer owns Emergency. <laughs> I was like, what? So Pfizer makes the vaccine for COVID and makes trillions and they own Emergency, which we all know everybody bought tons of vitamin C, right? in order to hopefully fend off COVID. So it's kind of like Pfizer made money both ways, but this is what's going on. So no longer are these little companies, mom and pop companies, right? With a vested interest to do what's right, good and just. They're organizations whose goal is to make their committee money, right? To make their stock you know, owners make money. That's what the goal is. And we need to remember that, right? You and I are our own health CEO for our health, we are not the CEOs of these companies. And so we need to make sure that our goals are in alignment with whatever their goals are. So that if you're taking some of their products, you understand that truly they have your best interest at heart, yay or nay. The world's globalizing. And so we're kind of left in this challenging headspace, right? Of like, okay, if I'm going to take supplements, whose supplements, when, where, why, how's the product? Because even doctors who claim that uh, these are my supplements, the majority of them, just have supplements made by another company and then they slap their label on it. And they're selling you the same product that you're getting from some random globalized company, but they put their name on it. That's the reality because the amount of time, energy, and cost it is to try to create your own supplement line with your own manufacturing organization. I mean, it's, it's outrageous. So as a result, so for example, if I wanted to go to a company like Metagenics or some of these others, I could say, I'd like one that just says Dr. Esser's you know, special supplement on it. And they'll make that for me. That's one of the options that they have instead of having their name on the label. So you want to be very careful and conscientious. And it takes us back to this place. The foundation of your health is your lifestyle. Then we've got the physical modalities. And then we move to supplements and pharmaceuticals. But I don't want you to be misunderstanding what a supplement is. A supplement is not a foundational right, tool for health. A supplement is in something in addition to an already excellent program. And as we'll talk about, that should have specific reasons that you're taking that supplement. So let's get into it. What does the science show? Well, my friend Mark Twain said it. Well, lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? But that's the truth, right? We can twist and bend the data and the evidence to make it say what we want it to say all too often. So we went back to this slide, multivitamins. This is the thing the majority of people are taking. Do according to the science, right? Because if we're going to take these because of science, because of data, we want to know what it says. Do multivitamins decrease your likelihood of death? Decrease, right? Let's take a look. Multivitamins, do they prevent cancer? The answer is no. Do they prevent heart disease? The answer is no. Do they reduce your risk of death? The answer is no. That is what all of the big studies and the meta-analysis looking at randomized controlled trials show. Multivitamins do not prevent cancer, do not prevent heart disease, and do not reduce your risk of death. So my question is, why are we taking one, right? Because you think that you're fulfilling some little micronutrient need that's like right in here, some little tiny thing. Well, that's called marketing to you because you have no strong data that says that taking the vitamin multivitamin does squat for you, except for make you feel better mentally that you think you're doing something and makes us somebody else money. So this is very important. So if you can show any data that says that using multivitamins changes people's health outcomes, then we're back to a different conversation. But the data that exists to date says, no, it does not. And as a result, when you're taking that multivitamin, yeah, I will tell you it's a personal decision, but there is not good science to support widespread or persistent or continued use. So if you're still using it on a daily basis, you are spending a bunch of random money. And it adds up over time. You might say, oh, it's only 15 cents or 20 cents per day. Well, I can tell you that still adds up, doesn't it? Over days, weeks, months, and years. So in addition, Multivitamins often include things that you may not want, like folic acid, which appears to potentially increase some mortality risk in, in some individuals. 
or things like iron that can lead for some people to excessive amounts of iron in their bodies. And they get some iron overload and increased sort of oxidation, et cetera. So unless you are anemic, there's no reason to be taking iron, right? Unless you have very low levels of iron in your body and low levels of hemoglobin and hematocrit. Why are we taking it? No good evidence to take it. You should be getting iron from your food where it's normally packaged up in an appropriate way. So next, vitamin review, DEEK, BCs, folate. These are the two big categories, right? We've got our fat-soluble vitamins, our DEA and K, and we've got our BCs, folate, et cetera, which are all lip, not lipophilic. I mean, they're not fat-soluble, they're water-soluble. So your fat-soluble vitamins, just by definition, you can overload on. You can become toxic on D E A N K. So, taking high doses of these can lead to problems long term. So, for example, high dose vitamin D at 10,000 international units per day, if you do that for about a month or two, you can end up becoming vitamin D overloaded, which leads to a host of negative side effects. Even in some of the water soluble vitamins taken at high doses, they can be risky. So, for example, B6, right? I just, B6 is great, and B2 as well, but B6 can be great for helping with neuropathies as a treatment. But if you take high doses, it actually can lead to neuropathies. I remember I had this lady, it was amazing. She was taking oral B6. She was taking liquid B6 as well. So she had this pills, she had the liquid, and she had a patch that would infuse B6 through her skin, and she developed neuropathies, and nobody could figure out what was going on. And she came to see me and all the usual problems had been ruled out. And I said, wait a second, how much B6? Wait a second, let's test your B6. So I sent her for a lab test and her B6 was thousands percent higher than it should be. And when she got off of the B6, after a couple months, her neuropathies went away. She was taking excess amounts, supraphysiologic doses. This is important. You understand something. We have been marketed to to suggest that if some is good, more is better, right? And with supplements, many people are just ramping them up, ramping them up to extremely high doses. Problem with that is that is not based in reality, right? And in fact, when you take a B vitamin, C vitamin, whatever it might be, that vitamin should be bound up and packaged with a lot of other things with fiber, with water, with other micronutrients, et cetera. And when you consume it all by itself, it makes it like a drug. Now it has a very focused drug-like effect, which may or may not be what you want. Vitamin D, of course, is not a true vitamin. It's a neurohormone, and it's formed in our bodies as a result of several steps, starting with UV radiation. So getting some of that radiation to the skin from the sun, right, to our arms, legs, back, and chest, can help the body to produce vitamin D that can then be therapeutically used throughout our body. Vitamin D is, of course, very important, right? It helps us with bones, with immune system health, and it even helps with diabetes, you know, and insulin levels. Crucial with throughout our body for all kinds of great processes. But does it reduce the risk of dying? Well, large cohort studies and meta-analysis, which suggest, yes, there is some mild improvement in mortality risk. Whether or not it helps with things like heart disease is questionable. And now here's what I would say. What I'm telling you is that these studies say that elevated vitamin D levels in your bloodstream appear to be predictive of better health with heart disease, with right death, et cetera. But I'm not saying that taking vitamin D changes these outcomes. That's the challenge that you and I face. Because the majority of studies that show that specific supplements, quote unquote, specific nutrients are beneficial, what they're really looking at in the study is, well, what are the average blood levels an individual has who's otherwise healthy and what is a low level of people have was sick? Well, that level can be influenced radically by nutrition, by exposures like sun, by toxic exposures, by genetic polymorphisms. In other words, different genetic pathways that some people have and others don't. So if you just look at the data and say, oh yeah, everybody has high vitamin D, you know, lives longer. Well, yeah, but does that mean that taking vitamin D makes them live longer? Or does it mean that those people live longer because they're outside in the sun exercising and their vitamin D is now higher uh, and that's just a marker of their exercise and their sun exposure? So these are very important questions to have. The big area where people talk about vitamin D, of course, is in bone health. And when you look at randomized controlled studies and meta-analysis, you can see the very bottom there, this is the stripped off directly off of the government's website 
uh, it was fascinating because they showed that right taking vitamin D supplementation alone provided no protection from fractures in 34,000 older adults followed over an extended period of time. That's very interesting to see, right? So the the, the taking of vitamin D, uh, whether or not it really alters the risk by itself of fracture, uh, the data is tenuous at best. In addition, there was a time where some studies seemed to suggest that vitamin D reduced the risk of falls. Well, data now says absolutely it does not, right? And there's, there's no, you know, sort of strong data to support that it would. But yet many people ran with that data and, oh, take more vitamin D, take more vitamin D, et cetera. So, you know, when we get to here, right, your ideal serum levels, right, are they more than 30? Are they more than 40? Are they more than 50, right? Where, where is the healthy spot, right, to kind of get that? And, you know, sunlight, as we talked about, repletion by supplement, but certainly the foods, just remember, no plant-based foods have significant amounts of vitamin D. You know, mushrooms, shrooms that I wrote there, have very small quantities of vitamin D, and on average, it's inadequate to meet your needs. So if you're over 50, if you have darker skin, if you work indoors, if you're right kind of female gender, if you have strong family history of osteopenia, osteoporosis, if you're a strict plant-based person like I am, you know, you need to know what your vitamin D levels are. So you should test and not guess. I do think there's value to that. And you would like to know what your vitamin D levels are. I don't, I don't go, oh, there's one hard number for everybody, but I'd like your vitamin D to be above 40 or so. I think that's reasonable. Now, I've taken vitamin D maybe 20 times in my life and my vitamin D levels are always normal. So I don't take vitamin D. But again, I'm testing, I'm not guessing. So if you take your, get your vitamin D level tested, and you're less than 20, I would argue that you probably would benefit from some repletion based on the data that exists. But I wouldn't expect it to by itself be some wunderkind where suddenly you feel amazing and everything resolves in your life and you feel like a million bucks. No, you've got to do all the other hard work, all the nutrition, all of the exercise as well. But try to achieve as a basic 15 minutes total body exposure when the sun's greater than 45 degrees of the horizon. You don't need to bathe nude like Chef AJ does on her roof, but you can kind of make sure you get your arms, legs, and upper back exposed to the sun. That's important, right? To kind of get that sun exposure. I don't think, if, I don't even think Chef AJ heard me. Um, then we've got the vitamin C levels. So vitamin C, right? Turns out it's everywhere in our body, right? Look in the eye and the lens and the pituitary. These are the quantities of vitamin C kind of everywhere, even our gastric juice, so on and so forth. And so Vitamin C is this water-soluble vitamin, right? That is very important for us to have throughout our body. People with higher rates of serum vitamin C, meaning in their bloodstream, have lower rates of death from heart disease, various cancers, uh, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that vitamin C supplementation is what resulted in their health benefits. It means they're eating foods that are rich in vitamin C and thereby they have elevated serum levels of vitamin C. You see, it's very difficult, just as an aside, to do a good study on supplementation and long-term health benefits, because you would have to literally lock some people away somewhere, feed them very specific foods, and track them for 10 years. Nobody's ever done those studies. So as a result, we're left with more of these randomized studies of people living in society and who are reporting what they ate, and we know how inaccurate that can be right? Because self-reported description of what you ate. I mean, how many of us remember what we ate four days ago on a, you know, on a Friday night at, you know, X hour. So, ah, gosh, that can be challenging. Now, based on the literature that exists, by the way, with vitamin C, it appears to shorten the duration of the common cold, but does not reduce the risk of getting ill. And the dosing on taking vitamin C for true therapeutic benefits with regards to URIs or upper respiratory infections is extremely high. Like starting with around a thousand milligrams every 30 minutes, and then taking that until you start having diarrhea, and then dialing back to a thousand milligrams once every hour. That is where there's actual appears to be some very therapeutic benefit. But that's not how most people take it. They take a thousand milligrams once or twice a day and see if they feel better. So we need to make sure we track some of the data. I like the Linus Pauling Institute. So if you Google search lpi.oregonstate.edu slash Mike slash vitamins, very interesting. They've got huge web pages with all the data and the science for every single micronutrient, every supplement, all of this. It's very interesting and very science-based. The recommended dietary allowances for vitamin C, you can see them. You can look at these later. You can kind of freeze this screen and look. But 
you know, when you look at where it all comes from, it comes from the sort of foods that Chef AJ and I recommend. All the bright, colorful, fresh vegetables and fruits. This is what we need to be loading up on. You see the absence of vitamin C, of course, results in scurvy with a host of problems with collagen and bleeding gums and unhealthy bones and all these problems. Well, men and, and you know, got scurvy on board ships because they didn't have fresh fruits and vegetables. It wasn't just because they didn't have limes. It wasn't like they had key lime trees throughout Scotland and everybody would like harvest key limes on a regular basis. And they didn't have massive 727s flying key limes from Puerto Rico or wherever to you know Scotland. People got scurvy because they weren't eating potatoes. Remember, potatoes, white potatoes have a lot of vitamin C in their skin. Yeah. And so people were not eating these fresh fruits and vegetables. And as a result, they ended up with scurvy because they were just eating wheat flour or some sort of corn flour that was dried or whatever it might be, some meal with water or beer on the ship. And so when you eat a plant-based program, you are inundating your body constantly with vitamin C. There's not a strong indication for you to take vitamin C supplements, right? If you want to do something when you start having a little bit of an acute upper respiratory infection, go on strict, you know, fast with nothing but either water for a day or go on fresh squeeze green only juice, you know, 16 ounces, four or five times a day with 64 ounces of water and a tiny little bit of a lean protein and just shut down the sugar, get into your body, sleep and rest and you'll get well. But if you want a supplement, you need to, as I mentioned, do a very high dose of vitamin C to actually have therapeutic benefit. Otherwise, it's placebo. Calcium. This is another one, as we saw, a lot of people using calcium supplementation, especially over the age of 60, almost 20% of people taking calcium. Calcium is crucial. Used with vitamin D and parathyroid hormone and thyroid hormone in order to help balance out circulating calcium levels, which are needed for neural health, for your neurons to fire appropriately, as well as for your bones to form. And right, we have a lot of calcium in our bodies. Now, as it turns out, though, calcium itself is meant to be kept in this equal balance. So if you're taking large quantities of calcium, your body doesn't even need it because you've got enough in your bones and enough in your food, uh, your body has to do something with it. So it increases your risk of kidney stones. And most tragically, it increases your risk of a heart attack by almost 15%, right? So in women over the age of 50, if they are taking calcium supplements, they increase their risk of cardiovascular disease, of heart disease and a heart attack by up to 15%. That's real when you look at the slides below, look at the diseases of the heart being the leading cause of death in women and in men. So what happens, right? You consume a calcium supplement, like calcium oxide, on average, some ground up oyster shells, and you get that into your bloodstream. It's a quick, sudden burst of calcium in large quantity. Your body binds the calcium with cholesterol, oxidizes it, and creates the plaques along your arteries. Not cool. You want to be eating calcium-rich foods like your deep green leafy vegetables, where now the calcium is absorbed slowly in small quantities over a progressive period of time, not just this huge burst. And you want to be eating all those vegetables that help reduce inflammation, right? And now your body's less likely to form those plaques. You can see some sources of calcium, right? It's all over the place. White beans, right? Kale, pinto beans, broccoli, red beans. Again, these are slides from the uh, Linus Pauling Institute. That's why they also have a bunch of meat and you know uh, dairy type things on there. But you can see, right? I was just eating some fresh figs, right? They hear from dried figs, quarter cups, 61, right? You can get calcium all over the place, right? And so if you're worried about your calcium, number one is you should get it tested. If your serum calcium is totally normal and your parathyroid hormone and your TSH are totally normal, you're getting plenty of calcium. You don't have to take it. See, people have this weird thought in their head. They think, if I take calcium, it suddenly goes from my mouth to my gut into my bones, and I get strong bones. It's completely inaccurate. Your body takes that calcium in. It looks and goes, I don't need more of this. I've got plenty of calcium. The issue is that your estrogen is dropping or that your thyroid hormone is dysfunctional or that you don't exercise and do strength building. So your osteoclasts, right, which are the little cells involved breaking down bone, they're working but your osteoblasts, which are building your bone, are not working. So your osteoblasts are like, dude, you're not exercising. You're not pushing your bones hard. So why am I going to take the calcium and do anything with it? I'm just going to leave it there or let you pee it out. So you've got to remember, taking calcium is on average not the problem for the majority of people. Most people in America are fine on calcium. And if you're worried about yours, 
get it tested. Ideal serum levels, you can see it, right? But you should also check your vitamin D, thyroid hormone, TSH, and parathyroid hormone and make sure those are all there. Again, avoid calcium carbonate, calcium oxide, avoid these basic supplements, unless there's some very specific reason, like you've got a parathyroid hormone dysfunction, you've had a surgery up here, and now your calcium levels are constantly low. Those are the people who should be on calcium. But otherwise, you should be eating a calcium diverse diet, right? With a, you know, getting plenty of calcium from a very diverse multicolored diet. What about our B vitamins? Well, there are lots of them out there with all kinds of cool names. I remember I memorized them once. They were so much fun to run through B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and all the different names. And if you don't get enough of them, they lead to bad things, right? Anemias, dermatitis, neuropathies, all of these things that none of us want, right? But the reality is if you're eating a well-balanced, playful, colorful program, you don't have to worry about them. But it's interesting to look, right? These are some nice slides, right? Showing the different areas where you, if you have low levels of such B vitamin, you're more likely to have this, right? Depression, memory loss, chelosis, glossitis, a, a glossy tongue with inflammation, all of these things. So if you've got some weird, funky thing going on and all you've been eating is a teetotaler's diet of some brown bread and a little like, you know, cup of tea, you might have a B vitamin deficiency, right? But if you, or if you have some bowel like gut dysfunction where you're constantly having diarrhea, et cetera. But the reality is, yeah, if you're taking drugs like loop diuretics or antacids, right? Or PPIs or hormone replacement therapy or all, all of those drugs can lead to you developing B vitamin dysfunction. Oh, interesting, right? It's not just the, the fish parasite, right? In Vietnam that leads to people with B vitamin deficiency. So again, this is why I'm a huge, huge advocate to try to reduce your medication needs because the more drugs you're on, the more potential side effects that you don't even know are happening to you, right? Like one of the leading causes of B12, right? Deficiency for many people ends up being that they're taking all these medications that impair the formation of, right? Uh, intrinsic factor in the absorption of their B12. So we, we don't want these things. So B12, of course, is water soluble. It's stored in your liver. You only need tiny little amounts every day, but it's a crucial molecule for everything from immune health to your brain, to red blood cell synthesis, et cetera. And so, you know, get your B12 checked, know what it is. Yours should be nice and high up in there, looking healthy. I mean, my B12 levels, every time I've checked in is in the 600s or so. And I take a B12, like 5,000 micrograms, whatever I think about it, which isn't every day. And so this obsession of like, I've got to take my B12 every single day or bad things will happen to me. No, actually your body's able to recirculate it pretty effectively. And so taking 5,000 micrograms twice a week, three times a week, whatever, you know, for me, I've got some little cherry flavored thing that doesn't have any much else added to it and is overall healthy. And it's like, okay, I actually like the taste of it. I'm going to pop it in whatever I want. I'm sure you can take it every day if you want, but that just increases your cost. That's up to you. So get your B12 levels checked. That's the key. If you have a malabsorptive pattern, if you're on drugs that cause you to limit absorption, then you need to be more conscientious, right? But if you check it, it's totally normal. You check it again in six months or a year and it's totally normal. Great. You're fine. You're good to go. You don't have to obsess. You don't have to be worried. And I do think for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, it's worth saying, remember, an absence of B12 in the vegan diet is not an argument for it not to be what is meant for phys human physiology. The absence of B12 is as a result of us washing our fruits and vegetables. Because remember, B12 is formed by bacteria on the ground. And so if, right, you wash your fruits and vegetables, which you should, you end up washing off the majority of those bacteria. And as a result, you no longer get them in your gut, so they're not producing B12 for you. When the cow has B12 in its flesh, the B12 got there because of the bacteria in the gut of the cow. And because it's eating off the ground all day, it's getting all the bacteria. But we humans decided that chronic diarrhea was not fun. And so we decided we'd start washing our fruits and vegetables so we'd be less likely to get it. But that's what led to us having a need for some of the B12 supplements, okay? Vitamin E, important for cell-mediated immunity and healthy cell membranes. As I mentioned, there are a lot of different isoforms for this. Now, early studies showed that vitamin E was inversely related to mortality. In other words, people who had higher levels of vitamin E in their bloodstream 
were more likely to live long and with fewer diseases. The problem was they then did studies in which they gave people vitamin E as a supplement. You know what they found? People actually died earlier when they were receiving a supplement. Now, the naysayers would argue, of course, that, well, they were largely using alpha tocopherol. And I did a little study the other day. I went in the local supermarket and I walked around to all the vitamin E's. 85% of all the vitamin E's were only alpha tocopherol. So they were incomplete vitamin E forms, right? They didn't have all the isoforms. And so it may have been that, but that's why that increased mortality. Or it may, in fact, be that vitamin E is purely a marker for the consumption of bran of the outer coating and layer of this insoluble fiber of things like whole wheat, you know, et cetera. And so vitamin E is just a marker that that person is eating more of that type of food. So again, uh, there's not a strong indication to use vitamin E as a supplement for the majority of us. We should be getting vitamin E from our nutrition, uh, but you can use vitamin E as a great solution to put on your skin, right? If you have some sort of a little dried out area or the like. But again, here is the, uh, right, this is what's concerning. Vitamin A, vitamin E, here are your studies for you. Some meta-analysis kind of looking at this all-cause mortality, showing us that, for example, when you take large quantities of vitamin A, right, it was associated with an increased all-cause mortality. A lot of people, again, like to say, oh, vitamin A, it's so important, such a good molecule, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna supplement with it. Problem is, when taken by itself as a pharmacologic type agent, it increases your risk of death. But if you're consuming beta carotene rich foods, which end up being precursors to vitamin A, you actually live longer, better, look better and feel better, right? That's at the heart of this. So we want to be eating a lot of quote vitamin A in the form of beta carotene, but we don't want to be taking vitamin A supplements unless there's a very specific reason. So here's the problem. Vitamins are normally bound up in food with multiple constituents and that results in a diffuse, gentle, balanced action on your body. Remember, all of this is about receptors. You've got cells, the cells have receptors, the receptors, something binds to it, it causes the cell to do something. When you take or eat food with vitamins in it, right? It's just, that's how it's made out of the ground, vitamins, minerals, et cetera. You have a very therapeutic diffuse effect across all the different receptor sites or many of them. But when you extract and isolate a vitamin, mineral, et cetera, and now has a very singular action. And this can lead to problems. Now I put in probiotics as supplements as well, a brief conversation here, right? This is the idea of using bacteria to enhance human health. You know that you've got trillions of bacteria in you and on you, right? In fact, one kilogram of your body weight is nothing but bacteria and 30 to 50% of your stool mass is nothing but bacteria. So you, you know, you're pooping out a bunch of bacteria. Well, it turns out these bacteria are crucial for you. They produce about 15% of your energy. They produce a lot of your different uh, B vitamins even for your own absorption. So they're very symbiotic when it comes to your health. So the question always was, well, if you take, right? If you take um, probiotics, can it help facilitate further the production of these essential nutrients, help with immune function, uh, help uh, outcompete pathogenic infections, right? Can they do that for you? And, you know, uh, well, the data is kind of mixed. The reasonable data would suggest that using probiotics to help with things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, there is some benefit in the literature. The use in chronic IBS, there is some benefit. People who have taken a lot of antibiotics and now have a lot of leaky gut and dysfunction, there is some literature to support that. And there is some data to support the use in atopic conditions, things like asthma, atopic dermatitis. For example, in mothers who have a family history and a personal history of asthma and atopic dermatitis, if they are given probiotics right around the time of birth and for the first two years, their infants have lower rates of atopic conditions as they age. Pretty cool, right? Something about changing the gut flora, which modified their immune response. So Again, if you have any of these issues, taking probiotics on a regular basis may make some scientific sense. But if you're otherwise healthy and don't have a lot going on, taking probiotics on a daily basis is not based in the science. And in fact, just costs you money. What about omega-3s? Omega-3s are a fascinating area, right? So omega-3s and omega-6s are some of these uh, long-chain fatty acids that are required for human health. You can see here the parent molecule omega-3s being linoleic acid and omega-3s alpha-linoleic acid. 
the body requires us to take in these in order for us to produce EPA or DHA. And as it turns out, right, don't forget about 70 to 80% of the mass of the brain and the nervous system is nothing but fat. And in fact, about 30% of the brain in by weight is DHA. So it's very important for our body to have these fats, not only for the function of the nervous, to the overall nervous production, but it turns out for regulating gene expression, for reducing inflammation, right? Because it's a potent antioxidant capacity, as well as for just overall immune neuroimmunologic health. All of this interplay is occurring and we need omega-3s for that. The recommended intake of omega-3s, you can see this is from the NIH's website, it kind of lines up that for adults, on average, 1, 1 to 1.6 grams per day on average, right? As the basic, according to the National Institute of Health recommendations, that this is a, quote, adequate intake, right? Now, when we look at the breakdown, we immediately see that animal-based sources have higher quantities of EPA and DHA, but plant-based sources have much higher quantities of ALA. Remembering, of course, that animals get their DHA and EPA, they're deriving it from ALA, in the large quantities often of algae that they consume in the ocean, right? That's why when you look, for example, at something like, where is it here? Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. It's on there somewhere, but I don't see it. Um, so you've got oysters, you've got shrimp, right? Very small quantity, et cetera. So these bigger animals, right, are like chicken, right? So our, our, our land-based animals, like here's your ground beef, right, and your chicken, have very little omega-3s, right? They're far more going to be on the omega-6 side, which can be more pro-inflammatory as a result of the grain, et cetera, that they're feeding on. So these omega-3s that have benefit are initially derived in the form of ALA from algaes and the like. And then they go up the food chain into uh, these aquatic organisms. Now, by definition, omega-3s cannot be synthesized by humans. So when we are consuming these, right, the problem comes into conversion. So let's go back to this slide. Here's flaxseed oil, right, right, or flaxseed hole. You can see it right here right at 2.35, right? English walnuts, 2.57, chia seeds, 5.06, so on and so forth. Well, when you consume that, there's a conversion limitation. So studies on young men and young women show that males, only 8% of the alpha linoleic acid was converted to EPA and only 0 to 4% converted to DHA. And then we had kind of females, 21% to EPA and 9% converted to DHA. So there is a pretty significant drop-off in the conversion from ALA into the EPA and DHA. And the EPA and DHA are gonna be the most functional forms of the omega-3s in our body with regards to neurologic health and all the other health benefits they have. So the studies say that, okay, omega-3s are important for human health. They appear to have a positive effect on heart disease risk, mental health, and cognition. But here are the problems with the studies that exist to date. The studies on average find, for example, let's especially talk about cognition because that's the big area that people wanna talk about with omega-3s. Do omega-3s decrease the likelihood of developing dementia? Here's what the science says. Studies find that people with higher levels of serum, meaning bloodstream, DHA and EPA, have notably lower rates of dementia, even up to about 20% reduced risk. But if you take adults over the age of 60 and you randomize them to either omega-3s or another just placebo, there is minimal benefit to supplementing them with omega-3s. So what does this say? To me, this says the following, that if individuals eat a program of nutrition over multiple decades in which they are getting adequate quantities of omega-3s, they are then creating healthy brain tissue and decreasing their likelihood of developing dementia. The data is not there in large randomized controlled prospective studies to support saying that if you are now 60 or 65 and you start taking omega-3s, that you're gonna radically reduce your risk of dementia over the next 20 years. There's no data for that. So that's very important for you to know. Now, in addition, we always wanna ask the question, can you get omega-3s from a plant-based program? Well, let's look, here's some of these. Look at this, walnuts, flaxseed, chia seeds, 
navy beans, avocados, Brussels sprouts, firm tofu, et cetera. Look at the amount of omega-3s per cup, per ounce, so on and so forth, and let's break it down based on the NIH recommendations for adequate intake. So the goal we said was 1.6 grams per day. If we do the conversion on that and say, okay, well, only 20% of that will be converted to EPA, right? In women, let's say, right? Well, then we need to consume at least eight grams per day of omega-3s in the form of ALA to achieve the 1.6 grams if we convert well. Yeah, so that's the idea. We need to consume at least eight grams. Well, how can you do that? Well, I put it together right here. What if you ate one ounce of flaxseed, a cup of tofu, a cup of Brussels sprouts, an ounce of walnuts? Right away, you're having 10.8 grams of ALA consumed per day right there. So you can, in fact, begin to look at the nutritional requirements of your body, look at the nutrients found in different sources and identify the ones that will not otherwise compromise your health. So for example, if you have severe heart disease or if you struggle with food addiction or if you want to radically lose weight, you might say, well, I don't want to eat all those walnuts and all that flaxseed, Dr. Esther. So, okay, well then let's identify other sources, other food sources like the, the beans, et cetera, and the Brussels sprouts, et cetera. And you need to look at the volume you need to consume in order to achieve the ALA recommendations and still have that adequate quantity taken in. I do think that's important. I do think that that's valid. And in addition, you're of course getting so many other micronutrients bound up with these food products that you're going to consume. If you're otherwise slender, you have no major heart disease and you don't struggle with food addiction, then having that flaxseed or having that little bit of walnuts, I'm not worried about you, but you need to know yourself, right? And so if you immediately start with one ounce of walnuts, the next thing is it turns into the whole bag of walnuts and now you put on five pounds or your cholesterol and triglycerides are going through the roof, that's problematic. And so we need to identify, this is where it gets specific. This is not a one size fits all. This is you as the CEO of your health company identifying and saying, hey, I think that it is important I get adequate omega-3s in my diet, and I'm going to do so in a very meaningful and intelligent way, in a way that doesn't compromise my long-term success. This is a great example is you know, similar. We see this in guys who are wanting to weightlift a lot and put on pro, you know, kind of lean muscle mass or ladies who want to do the same, and they go, well, I've got to now eat all of this you know, kind of beef. And it's like, no, no, you don't. You just need to look at your nutritional portfolio and identify more calorie-dense foods that will allow you to get adequate calories and adequate protein, but don't compromise your health with the high cholesterol right, foods and high saturated fat foods. So same thing here with the omega-3s. It can You can achieve the required and recommended amounts of ALA that then converts into EPA and DHA and be totally fine. It's kind of interesting, right? Because I, I probably have had fish maybe three or four times in my whole life kind of a thing. I Certainly none in the last 10 years. And um, it's fascinating because, right, I've never had a problem with my omega-3. Now you can get your omega-3 levels tested. There are a couple of companies out there that test your serum levels if you're curious. But again, that's a snapshot in time. It is not a snapshot historically, right? So it'll tell you what your average levels are now, but it may be of value to you. And it's interesting as the CEO of your health company, if you want to look at that. Other supplements to consider for use, turmeric, boswellia, ginger, things for inflammation, things for joint health. And you see kind of all the benefits here uh, as compared to standard medications. A couple others I'm just going to hit as we trail out to the end. Lavender oil. If you struggle with anxiety or depression, there are great studies showing that lavender oil in this form called Silexan had equal effects as lorazepam for generalized anxiety. Equal effects, right, as the, you know, kind of uh, antidepressant medication for depression. So very powerful for many people. So if you struggle and the mind-body work is not been enough, the exercise is not adequate, you maximize everything else and you don't want drugs, consider lavender oil and acetylcysteine for people with severe mucus buildup, right? Because we use this to treat kids with cystic fibrosis and it's also, right, kind of the treatment for Tylenol toxicity. So this is a potent molecule for facilitating liver detoxification. But if you're otherwise healthy, do you need to take it on a regular basis? No. But might you decide to use it if you struggle with chronic you know, mucus and, and uh, chronic uh, upper respiratory infections? Well, yeah, maximize your nutrition first. Maybe do a therapeutic water fast for a period of time. But if you want to add a little you know, N-acetylcysteine, the risk is likely low. Another fun molecule out there, astaxanthin, right? This potent carotenoid pigment that grows, right? It's formed in red algae that grows. This is at a place that grows in Hawaii, right? With fresh you know, water they pump up into there, et cetera. But they do actually have some data that shows that it decreases the severity and the length of sunburns. Well, I'm not on the tennis court all the time, 
right? Is it worth throwing a little bit of astaxanthin either on me as a paste or in my mouth? Well, there's some studies that show it decreases the formation of fine wrinkles, right? So again, if you have a specific reason, right? Well, maybe you take it, right? But so here's what our takeaways are. There's a wide array of substances on the market. We need more and consistent evidence. Processing and preparation is variable and the effects are unclear. My recommendations on supplements are the following. Let food be your medicine. Let supplements be just that, a supplement to an excellent diet. Use supplements for specific conditions. Do not use them as a general, I'm going to take this. It's just a, I don't know, I just take it, right? Because all you're doing there is spending money and potentially having risky side effects for your health. Also, I would recommend if you're going to use something, it should be something that is certified, right? Here's USP, you can look at this later, right? Or the NSF certification that at least we have a third party evaluating for heavy metals, for toxins, for you know any types of infective agents, et cetera, because things can get in, right? So here are the concerns I have. Product safety, product efficacy, does the product match with whatever the studies are that are being quoted? I don't want you to quote me a study on how certain supplement helps with heart disease and then you look and the study was actually in rats and it only went on for two months. That doesn't equate to somebody taking a supplement for the next 20 years of their life. What products are also in your supplements like preservatives, anti-caking agents, colorants, all this sort of stuff that are toxins that you don't want to get. So identify the problem in your life that you're trying to address. Determine if your lifestyle will be adequate. It may in fact, right? You want to lose weight? Follow Chef AJ's recommendations or mine, right? Get my four-week program, get going, right? But if the problem you're trying to address cannot be addressed through nutrition, through sleep, through emotional poise, through exercise, then consider the supplement. Review the studies if they exist on the supplement. Check if they're available here in the US, right? So for example, the lavender oil, I showed you that the studies on lavender oil, on average, we're using a product called Silexan. Well, Google search it, you'll see it is available in the US. If it all lines up, maybe you trial the supplement for a specific period, the same way the study did. I'm going to try it for two weeks. I'm going to try it for six months. I'm going to try it for four weeks. Then reevaluate your symptoms or your labs or whatever problem you're dealing with, the probiotics. I keep having this diarrhea. I'm going to try the so probiotic. I'm going to use it for one month. If there's no improvement, I'm done. Modify accordingly. Don't build up this war chest of supplements on your countertop and every morning you're popping all these things. You have no idea why or if they even help you, but you've just always done it. I know we're running out of time. You all can look at these later. These are some examples, right, of people using supplements in a less than ideal way. I love this. I have an earache. 2000 BC, here eat the root. 1000 AD, the roots heathen, say the prayer. 1850, the prayer is superstition, drink the potion. 1940, the potion snake oil, swallow the pill. 1985, the pill is ineffective, take the antibiotic. 2000, the antibiotics artificial, here eat the root. <laughs> and everything that goes around comes around. And certainly that's where we find ourselves. So the truth about supplements is number one, that the food you eat is even more important. And number two is that a supplement should just be that, supplement to an already excellent nutritional program. And with that, I'll end. Uh, I really like this presentation a lot and it was very timely. And my favorite thing you, I think you said is test, don't guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, as much as I admire so many doctors, you know, they say, well, doctor, so-and-so said to take this, but maybe taking this isn't right for you in the amount the person says. And so many people just, just take stuff because somebody says without really knowing what they're taking and why. That's right. And my grandfather always talks about this. It's a very fine and dangerous line for us as physicians. We have a dire desire to help, uh, but there's also an opportunity to generate income. And so many physicians uh, come up with their own brand of whatever, um, and, and then they start marketing it heavily and pushing it. And once they begin to do that, they're kind of, then they're lost. There's no way for them to come back because they now have a vested interest, et cetera. And that's why to date, I've not started my own supplement line or done those sort of things because I worry that even though I'm well-intentioned, I would get sucked in by looking at my bank account and going, well, why have I only sold that many? Let me put another ad up. Let me send an email out, you know, et cetera. Um, and at that point, then you become a pill pusher, right? And a snake oil salesman. Uh, and that's that's a risky place to be because then you compromised your integrity. Yeah, well, I know Dr. McDougal wholeheartedly agrees with you. And, and, and you know, sometimes you, you feel like there's a conflict of interest if the person that is telling you to take the supplement is the one that's actually selling it or manufacturing it. 
Oh, for sure. And I think, I mean, I have such a, you know, kind of respect for Dr. McDougall. I mean, he could have made millions of dollars off of supplements by this point, um, you know, just with his name, reputation, what he's done. And the fact that he's chosen not to do that is uh, of great credit to him. Yeah. And, you know, um, I mean, I do take B12, like, like, you know, because we're supposed to I yep. take it very rarely now because it was too high and I was just paying for expensive urine. But I, the brand I chose to take is the one I, I saw sold at True North, which is called Pure Encapsulations. But now you tell me they're sold by Nestle and it's like, I don't know if I want to take that brand anymore. <laughs> That's right. You know, well, and at the heart of it, right, is many of these companies still will make clean, quote, you know, OK products, but it's just, yeah, you hate to see that because then it kind of robs you of this feeling like, you know, you're doing something over here that's, you know, unique and good and whatever. But at the end of the day, as a CEO of our health company, we just want a good, clean product, right, that meets our needs. Um, but, but yeah. yeah. I, I don't, I want to respect your time. Do you have time for any questions that have been sent in? No, today, I do have a couple minutes if you want to address anything. Otherwise, I would appreciate I would appreciate it. And guys, if you're watching on Facebook, we can't see your comments. So you have to go to YouTube if you want us to see you in the chat and in general, not in general, when there's, I guess it's a medical doctor, you do need to submit your questions in advance because we have so many. This first one is from Vi and she says, my cardiologist says I cannot take an omega-3 supplement because I'm on Eliquis for AFib, a blood thinner. I'm whole food plant-based and I eat one tablespoon of ground flaxseed and one tablespoon of whole chia seeds at breakfast daily in my oatmeal and lots of dark leafy greens. Is this enough omega-3s? Which omega-3 test do you recommend? I mean, it sounds like you're addressing, right? With using the, the concept that I showed you, right? That kind of one ounce equals this, so on and so forth. So the likelihood is you're probably fine. Now, again, whenever people say eat a lot of dark leafy greens, I think Chef AJ and I roll our eyes because we say, well, what does that really mean to you? <laughs> and so need to make sure that you are really crushing it there, you know, big, massive salads several times per day, et cetera. Um, but if you're curious to test yourself, I think the most commonly used one is just called Omega Quant. Um, and so you can get that and you prick your finger, put a little blood on it and send it back to their lab and they give you an answer. Again, as I mentioned, right, this is a momentary check in time of what your omega-3 levels are. But if you're curious to know them and they're worthwhile knowing, uh, sure, check it, see what it is. And if it's crazy, crazy low, hmm, interesting. We need to readdress the nutritional aspect. Okay. So we've had other guests on the show that said the finger stick, they don't recommend, they mm -hmm. always recommend the venipuncture just yeah. for accuracy. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can kind of, I, I personally have not seen any head to head comparison. I think it'd be interesting to look at, um, you know, so to see kind of how accurate they both are. Also, she mentioned that she's taking a tablespoon of whole chia seeds. Aren't you supposed to grind chia seeds for the yeah, benefit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly if they're both whole, you're not going to digest as many, you know, either the flaxseed or the chia. You're not going to digest as well. Right. This one isn't about supplements, but I feel like it's a kind of fun question and important so that people don't stay away from beets. And this is from... Nancy, I love to eat beets raw and cooked, but when I eat them, I have within 12 to 24 hours later, either in my urine or bowel movements, a red color from the beets. So that's normal though, right? Very normal. Yep. No need to be fearful. If you're not eating beets and you've got a red discoloration to your um, you know, urine or bowel movements, that's concerning. Great. Cause she was worried because she says she's not anemic or hemoglobin's 14. And she thought maybe she was missing some enzymes or some, missing something, but that's like everybody, that happens to everybody, right? Not just Nancy. That is correct. <laughs> okay. I thought so. But I think for the first time it, hands, it happens to a person, um, they get worried because not everybody I think knows that, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. This, it can be a little scary for people at first. Yep. Yeah. Um, this one is orthopedic, but you kind of are an orthopedic doctor. So can I give it to you? Well, I don't think you've got, let's do. All right. This is from Tammy, 61 years old, plant-based, no SOS or no sugar oil, low salt, BMI 20.2, BP 97 over 68. I have pain in my second and third thumb joints, both hands, but worse in the right hand. I'm using Arnica gel twice a day and a brace at night. Suggestions for exercises or anything to help with pain and future degeneration. Degeneration, yeah. Very commonly, yeah, very commonly we develop osteoarthritis of the thumb kind of right down in here or in here. And with remember, the 50% of the work of the hand is done by the thumb. Every single thing you do here, the thumb is involved. And so this joint right here tends to wear down over time and we get uh, a loss of the smooth layer of cartilage. And so... 
Uh, simple, non-invasive treatments for this include some of the topicals that you're trialing, like the Arnica um, or menthol-based solutions. Uh, oral supplements that can help with this would be turmeric at 1,500 milligrams a day or boswellia at 1,000 milligrams per day or ginger at 40 milligrams per day. Um, other things that become a little bit um, are also non-invasive include a little thumb splints you can wear like uh, what's called a Santa Barbara splint. It's a little bit on the thumb and supports it, but leaves the tip free. You can use when you're doing a lot of heavy lifting or repetitive use with your hands. Um, warm topicals can help as well. Often some people use wax baths, right? And you get one of those online. You put your oh, hands I love those. That's, a, that's something they, some, uh, they do that sometimes right. for manicures. Yeah. I think we that's lost That's right. It. And be very oh, yeah. helpful. Uh, can you hear me? That'd be very helpful for kind of arthritis in the hands. And then we get to invasive things. Invasive things would be the various forms of injections. Uh, these injections come as either biologics like PRP and stem cell or things like steroids and gels. So I do PRP or platelet-rich plasma injections for this problem frequently and usually gives people up to 18 months of benefit. Yeah. You were freezing up a bit, but the thing you talked about, the wax thing, that's often done at a, a nail shop for manicure and pedicure. They'll do that just because it, it's nice. That's right. And so you can buy one of those online and actually is very therapeutic for hand and uh, thumb pain. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, this is from Gail. And she wanted to know if, if, if you think that magnesium supplements would help some of her issues. One is that she... Oh, averages only five to six hours of interrupted sleep each night. And also her belly protrudes, even though she's quite a slender eating this kind of diet. And uh, she heard magnesium might help with both. What are your thoughts? So um, magnesium has a, a great, a reasonable deal of, of evidence to support kind of sleep, mood, neurologic function. Uh, and magnesium, especially in the form of magnesium citrate, and even in some of the other forms, magnesium oxalate or magnesium oxide or magnesium glycinate or magnesium picolinate, all of these different forms can uh, accelerate gut motility, right? So they can make you have more rapid bowel movements. Uh, whether or not they will alter some of sort of distension in the abdomen is uh, depends upon whether or not you're just having some chronic yeah. constipa constipation. Uh, if the constipation and retention of gas is what's making you bloated, then the magnesium may help some with that. You want to make sure anytime that your abdomen is a little distended, is there anything else going on, right? You know, is there, are there fibroids in your uterus? Do you have any other things that might be of concern that might be actually leading to that? If all those things are normal, also want to look at posture and core strength, right? Are you doing enough core to keep those abs strong so they're holding your body up and in? So, uh, you know, magnesium is a low risk proposition for most people, it helps with sleep and mood and, you know, get bowel motility, but it may not resolve all of your problems there with the, the, the bowels, or, you know, et cetera. So make sure if it doesn't, that you address those other areas. Okay. Do you have time for one more question or say goodnight, Gracie? As I've got say. one. I've got one more for you. You got one more in you. Thanks. This is from Jean. And she says, as a postmenopausal woman, I am concerned about the mixed information regarding how excessive supplemental calcium and vitamin D might increase the risk of existing atrial fibrillation. What are your thoughts? Well, as I mentioned, right, atrial fibrillation can be interrelated to impaired blood flow to this sinus node in the heart that sets the rhythm of the heart. And so if you block up little tiny arteries that feed that node, that controller of the heart, then the person's more likely to enter into atrial fibrillation. And so consuming large quantities of calcium as a supplement, as I mentioned, increases that risk of heart disease. Uh, and so it arguably could increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. So there's no reason to be taking calcium by itself. We should be, first of all, testing your calcium level. If it's totally normal, you, you should just be getting calcium from your food. So again, testing that calcium, parathyroid, thyroid hormone levels, all that's normal. Eat a well-balanced, diverse diet uh, with you know calcium variability, meal to meal. And so that's something I will address briefly is that don't make sure that you're not getting sucked into this false perception of looking at your meal as though it's got to be perfect in every single area, every single time. Like I post on sometimes social media and I hope you all join me at S or help on Instagram or Facebook. I often post what I eat. And sometimes I'll put up on there, like I ate nothing but watermelon for lunch and people go, where's your protein? Where's your this? Where's your that? What are you going to do? Oh, there's no omega threes, et cetera. I'm like, what are you smoking people? Chillax, right? Not every single meal has to be this perfect balance of every single macro and micronutrient. 
But what we need to look at is the global diverse, right, over days and weeks, what we're consuming to make sure that we're getting adequate X, Y, and Z. So you don't want to use that as an excuse to eat poorly, but you make sure, right? So like Chef AJ and I will often like talk about it. If you just, you're not even hungry, right? Why are you eating? Have a glass of water, right? Wait until your hunger appears, but not this feel not this tendency or this feeling that you've got to have every single meal perfectly balanced amount of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, micronutrients, blah, 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 et cetera. Yeah. But rather a diverse, well-planned out long game that gives you all the nutrition that your body requires. And then, as I said today, supplementing where and when appropriate based on specific needs that you've identified by understanding your health fully and completely. You know, Dr. Esther, have you read The Pleasure Trap? Of course. Well, one of the chapters is looking for health in all the wrong places. And Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer make the case that in the majority of cases, the lack of health isn't caused by deficiencies, but by excesses. Absolutely. 100%. The Chinese proverb says that you live off of a quarter of what you eat and your doctor lives off the other three quarters. Absolutely. And people are always looking to add, add, add when the reality is, is that maybe it's time to take something away. Love it. Okay. Well, I love you. You are just a wonderful guest and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Dr. Esser. Bye all. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We have a bonus show in just about five minutes with Meg Donahue from Mama Says. we got an amazing discount this week if you're interested in trying the products. And tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time, I have a first time guest who blew me away when I heard her speak at the Seattle Veg Fest. She is a vegan radiation oncologist, and she's going to tell you what you need to do to avoid cancer.